Um, I'm sure people will join us um, as we keep going, but thank you everyone who's here today uh, for the wine tasting in Napa. Thank you, Brian. As you can see, he is already out in the vineyard ready for our tasting. Um, so I will hand it over to Rob Dill uh, from Aspire Technology Partners to kick it off. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um, good to have everybody on today. Uh, I, I can see, obviously, some of you guys I know. Um, some of you who are new, nice to meet you. Um, so I just wanted to, I'm going to kick off, just give a little bit of introduction on, on myself, Aspire. Um, then I'm going to hand it over to the Cisco team. And then uh, hopefully as, as quickly and as promptly as possible, we'll get over to the fun part, which is uh, learning about the, the super cool vineyard that you can see in the video up there and uh, drinking some wine. So uh, with that, um, as I said, Robert Dill uh, with Aspire Technology Partners, uh, been here about nine years. So almost half the time the company's been in business. Um, we are uh, a, a Cisco first partners, um, as we'll kind of talk about um, today in regards to WebEx and the unified communications platforms. Um, but we do cover the gamut of the entire infrastructure. So everything from networks, collaboration to security and data center. Um, and whether that's on-prem or in the cloud, we can support that design, implementation, and then post deployment support. We've got a 24 by seven uh, network and security operations center out of Eatontown, New Jersey, uh, which is where headquarters is. Um, all US based uh, employees, no 1099. So everybody is Aspire on paper. Um, that being said, um, I know kind of the transition here and, and here's where I'll hand it over to the, the Cisco team in a minute um, is from the unified communications perspective. So uh, a lot of organizations today have um, <laughs> on-premise systems. You've got the hardware, the voice gateways, um, everything's being managed yourself uh, with, with kind of the, the push to go everything cloud and where we want to talk about uh, today is making that transition to uh, the same thing that you probably have today, but just managed in the cloud. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Katie, if you want to click to the next one, um, just a quick agenda. Um, we'll we'll kind of go through uh, the WebEx suite as a whole because it's as most people are probably familiar with it, it's as a conferencing platform. Um, but we'll talk about how, uh, you know, there's more to that in terms of the cloud-based um, WebEx calling. Um, what that's going to mean from a collaboration perspective and, and where the, the kind of rubber meets the road for getting you there and, and managing that moving forward. And then uh, over to the fun part, which would be uh, talking with Brian and, and Bouchane Vineyards. Um, hopefully everybody got all their wine and is uh, as excited as I am staring at it right now, waiting to pour less. <laughs> um, so with that, um, Seamus, Dan, I'll, I'll pass it over to you and then Katie, I know you'll, uh, you'll do the man of the hour with Brian. Yeah, thanks Rob. We appreciate it. So my name is Dan Schwartz. I am the WebEx PSS for the central and southern New Jersey. Uh, region. Um, I also have Dan McGee on as well. Dan covers the northern end of New Jersey. So with Aspire, uh, we do cover all of New Jersey from the Atlantic Shore region as a whole. Um, on this call as well is Joy Moore, who is our Atlantic Shore Territory Manager as well. And then Seamus McDonough, who is going to be taking on this presentation in a couple minutes. Seamus, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Everybody, I'm Seamus McDonough. Uh, I lead sales acceleration for our WebEx small business team here in the U.S. So very nice to uh, to meet all of you and uh, talk about WebEx. Yeah, we also have on the line Brian Allard um, from Bouchin Vineyards, and I will let him introduce himself once we get to his portion, but enjoy the view in the meantime. Cool. We can just jump right into the next slide. We're going to talk about WebEx calling and really what the future of work looks like really for us at WebEx and really what it means to our customers today and really how we can help you get there. So, you know, as we talk about the evolution of work and what we've been going through for the last 18 months, if not more, two years, whatever it's going to be, you know, when we look at WebEx as a platform and our customers, you know, everybody's working from home, in the office, from, from anywhere. And it's really a combination of all of those things within the same day and even down to really even the same hour, you know, taking a call from your office, uh, you know, immediately getting in a car, continuing that hands-free, of course, and then, you know, maybe walking into another office and being able to connect. That, that way that you work has to be seamless. It has to be easy. And it needs to be one single application that does that. 
And that's what we're doing with WebEx. WebEx is no longer just a meetings platform or, you know, same old WebEx, you know, the, what you see, what you saw years ago. Over the last 18 months, we've added, added a thousand plus new features and functionalities, as well as eight acquisitions to allow us to really transform what the product is today, which is meetings, calling, messaging, devices, and all of those things together. So next slide. So when we talk about that single application, this is really what it looks like. This is that new WebEx. You know, making sure that no matter how you're connecting, whether you're on your mobile device, you're on a computer, you're on your tablet, you know, whatever type of mobile device you have, it's gotta be easy and it's gotta be flexible. And then it needs to go with you. And if we're all in an agile world, we're working from wherever we're gonna be at, we need to make sure that the application itself works and it needs to be easy. It's not really made for enterprise people. It's made for any user, whether you're a small business or moving into the enterprise or enterprise, you know, that is, uh, you know, focused and acting more as a small business. This product works for anybody. And next slide. And when we look at the way that we're transitioning our customers from maybe premise based to, to the cloud and customers are asking us like, hey, Seamus, you know, am I going to lose any feature functionalities? You know, the way that I've utilized call manager, the way that I've utilized my premise based call control in the past. Am I going to lose any of those feature functionalities when I move to WebEx Calling? And how does all of this work? Well, WebEx Calling truly is that, you know, full feature PBX out of a single license. You know, it's not like when you when you purchase WebEx Calling, you got to add extra licenses and extra costs on the back end, all these hidden things that you didn't know about when you want to turn on a new feature. It's that all-in-one encompassing platform. I look at it as an Alexander Graham Bell feature set. That's super cheesy, I know, but it, may, it paints the picture of the the features and functionalities that our customers need to run their day-to-day -day business, especially from a phone perspective. And whether utilizing the, the physical app or the, the soft client application, as you see here, you know, with the visual voicemail, call transfer, call recording, all of these things, multiple lines, or you're using the physical phone like you see behind me here, that the way that you use it needs to be the same. And you, you, you have to have those features no matter how you connect. So as, as we move forward, we also wanted to ensure that we're that we're keeping up with what's going on with the FCC regulations. You know, Enhanced 911 and Ray Bombs Act and Carey's Law is so important. And it was so important that the government passed a law that said every, every phone solution has to have this. We used to charge for Enhanced 911 services through Red Sky. Now we just baked it in. He said, you know what, let's just make sure that this is there for our customers. So when they call 911, they immediately get a hold of that, you know, that, that emergency responder. And then that emergency responder needs to know where they are. So whether you're, you know, you pick up your, you pick up your laptop, like if I leave my office and I go work somewhere else, it's it, when I connect to the, the new internet, it's going to say, what's your, what's your location? And I would type that in on my computer. From a phone perspective, the mobile client, we work with all the major carriers. So we know exactly where that individual is if they call 911 through the application itself to make sure that our customers are always safe because that's important. And those are things that we're including for free. So like I said, we're not adding extra. If you want to turn this on, you're not paying more. It's already baked in. And that's what that's what's important for our customers because we talk about the features and the security and so as we go into the next slide security is important Secu it's secure by design and private by default end to end encryption the second largest private network behind the department of defense that's what webex is built upon and the same thing that webex calling is built upon you know all these data centers throughout throughout the united states and the world ensuring that you have that privacy that protection that fraud protection throughout and it's also throughout the features, as you see on the next slide, too. When we look at the features, I talked about the Alexander Graham Bell feature set. I want you to know that there's things that we've thought about and even more that we're continuing to build upon. The things that our customers need are here. So you know if you're moving from a you know premise-based call control and you say, oh my gosh, how the heck am I going to manage all this? How am I going to, how is all this going to work? Can I keep my same phone as we go on to the next slide and we talk about devices? Absolutely, you can keep some of the same devices. We can also talk to you about new devices that are available. Um, so if you have some of the latest and greatest, like 7888 or 6800 series phones, we can do we can do a, a quick flash firmware upgrade on those. Let us know. Let our team know. Let let Dan McGee and Dan Schwartz or Joy or Katie and Robert know what you have, so we can help you. And we have tons of video devices as well that can help transform your environment as well. As we know that video is so important these days is, you know, Brian's out there in Napa hanging out. You can't even hear the wind blowing in the background. The things that we're doing with audio intelligence and those conversations that we can have with you can truly help you transform your business. And that's what we want to do because we're excited to help you, you know, have a new way of connecting. As we go on to the next slide, it has to be easy to manage too. 
And that single pane of glass is how we do that through Control Hub. Control Hub is that one-stop shop. So whether, you have, whether you're managing one location or tens of locations, all of that's done through Control Hub. You could be sitting in Napa in the middle of a vineyard and be able to, as long as you have internet connection, be able to go change anything within the phone system or within the WebEx meetings platform yourself as well. You can be sitting on the beach and join, join yourself and you can have access to it. You don't have to be on site to do this. And devices can be stood up in as little as five to 10 minutes. Seamus, I can't be correct. It's correct. We can show you how it's done. We'd love to give you a demo on how that works as well. So as we tie all this together on our last, you know, on one of our last slides, and you look at WebEx as a whole, why? Why should we move to WebEx? Why are we having this conversation here? Well, the value of WebEx is, is really, you know, can be summed up in a couple of things. That single continuous app for working, that single app for working, you know, messaging, meeting, calling, all of it in one thing. You know, that in intelligence and automation built throughout where we have WebEx Assistant, we got closed captioning, we have real-time translations, we have the ability to turn on Babel Labs and background noise removal so you don't hear wind blowing or dog barking or, or kids screaming. You know, the seamless integration from an internal and external collaboration communication. Whether you're speaking with somebody within your organization or outside, that has to, we want to make sure that all of it works continuously together, as well as the hardware and software integration. Not only do our devices work phenomenally with WebEx, but we understand that you know what, you know, there's going to be a time you might be invited to a different call as well or a different meeting. Well, you know what, that investment protection with those devices is there. You can utilize these devices with other platforms. These video on point, you can use it on Google if you wanted to. I'm not going to say all the other words of, of our competitors, but they work within the other platforms as well. That platform integration, we've integrated with more than 150 applications and platforms for that seamless, continuous work. We know that as much as I'd want to say is once you have web apps, you never need anything else in the world. <laughs> no, I have an iPhone. I have hundreds of apps on my phones. So we understand that our customers need other apps as well. So, and they need to work together. That's what we're doing. That integration is key. Security, it's got to be secure or else why, you know, if we're not selling you a secure platform, I would feel bad. You know, you've been talking to you. So security will always be there. And that single pane of glass. So, you know, when, we, when you look at the environment and you look at your, at your uh, organization on this last slide, you know, think to yourself, like, is good enough enough? Or can we work with you to help transition and talk to you and having a conversation on this next slide um, around really what we can help your business and have these conversations around? So we're truly excited for that. I didn't want to take up too much of your time. I really just wanted to, to share with you and show excited as, as we are to talk about WebEx. And uh, I'll, Katie, I'll pass it back to you. I don't know if you're going to pass it over, Brian. We're going to do a little Q&A, but uh, thank you so much for your time, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we just wanted to open it up to anyone who um, wanted to uh, ask a question or have any additional input to what Seamus had just walked us through. Yeah, and Katie, the, the, one, the one thing I'll bring up, because I, I know it's uh, <laughs> probably one of the more commonly asked questions is, um, we 100% can do uh, trials within your organization. So one of the things that both, you know, Cisco, Aspire, together, we can set that up for you, free of charge, for us to set that up. I mean, give you a number, the PSTN, the whole shebang to be able to use it, play with it, test it. Um, super easy for us to do, and we can set that up. So whether you've got an existing on-premise system, whether you've got a, a non-Cisco system, and you just want to test it out to see what it looks like, we can we can set that up. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Um, if anyone has interest in continuing the conversation, as always, please feel free to reach out to us at info at aspiretransforms.com. Also check out our site at aspiretransforms.com. With that, I will turn it over to Brian um, in Napa for our wine tasting. Cheers, everybody. Welcome uh, as it is. I'm broadcasting from the top of my vineyard for the first time ever. Uh, two years ago, Bouchain was the first winery to, to use WebEx to elongate our customer journey. I'll talk about that in a second. And today we're having kind of a historic moment. I've been able to take my system out to the middle of our, our vineyard overlooking the San Francisco Bay. The wind today is about, I don't know, maybe it's 50 miles an hour right now. So if I get blown over, just understand that. <laughs> and <clears throat> and for those of you who want to drink some wine right now, uh, the wine that we sent you is from the this top of this vineyard. So if you want to open up the red wine, um, 
I'll give you a couple of tips just to know for the summertime uh, that'll improve every single wine you're gonna have. Number one, open up your wine today uh, an hour before you're gonna drink it. And that's true for every wine that you're ever gonna drink, especially red wine. And then for those of you on the East Coast, don't forget this. Don't replicate. I grew up in Vermont. I had this, I went to school in Boston. I drank all of my wine way too hot in the summer. You want, even for your red wine, even if it's a Cabernet, some big bruiser football player style wine, you want an ever so slight chill on the wine, 60 degrees. So for those of you who are drinking today, open your wine in advance, have it at the right temperature. This summer, if you're gonna have a dinner party on your terrace, don't take your bottle of wine outside and, and let it hang, hang out there at, at 85 or 95 degrees. You're gonna be drinking at 30 degrees too warm. You want it around 60 degrees. And the reason is you wanna be able to experience the sort of the top and the bottom part of the symphony, if you will. <clears throat> so those are two things to really improve everything that uh, you ever do with a bottle of wine. And the third thing has to do with location. So today I'm, I'm broadcasting from Napa. I'm broadcasting for the first time on WebEx from the middle of my vineyard wirelessly. And the, the wine that you're drinking is from this vineyard here. And so when you go to a store, the third little tip I have for you is think of finding the best wine in any kind of section, red, white, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. You're looking at all those bottles and think of it like doing a map search on the phone for a party. You want more and more specific geographic information. Bouchain is a small family winery and we've uh, sent you a wine from this vineyard that we take care of for the last 41 years. And it's a great way of sort of thinking about any wine in the world. The more and more specific geographic information on a bottle of wine on the label is your, your, usually your tip to spending $5 more or $5 less and getting twice as much uh, for your value. So those are the summertime tips. Um, since this is a WebEx meeting, it occurs to me that I probably should explain why this has been so important for us here at Bouchain. Um, two years ago, it was a historic moment when we adopted WebEx to reach out to our customers. Today is, is uh, the phase two, if you will. Uh, we're starting a taste of technology tour. It's gonna be the first of its kind in the entire wine industry around the world where we're going to take customers through the vineyard and we're gonna culminate a discussion of, we're gonna kind of talk about wine like we just did a little bit. And then we're gonna talk about the context of growing great wine and the problems in the wine industry and how technology is going, can be used to solve them. Things like water use, gas use, uh, the cost of labor. And then I'm bringing people up here to the top of this vineyard only the, the camera is going to be looking in the other direction over across the San Francisco Bay, and we're going to allow them to take live video selfies with their friends all around the world and give a toast to their friends and family and colleagues. And uh, today's the first day that we're, we're finalizing the technology. And last week I took my first four corporate uh, uh, reservations for the, for the tour. So it's, it's such an important moment. Small family wineries, all over our country, number one, they're losing market share to the big, huge wineries and conglomerates. Number two, wine in general is losing market share. Millennials uh, tend to like their local mixologists more. And so even though wine is a 5,000 year old business, in some ways um, it's the least understood of all of the, of all of the booze that we can buy. We have to, open the bottle with a cork and half of Americans barely know how to take it out of the bottle. So the wine industry has a messaging problem and it has a market share problem. And small wineries like Bouchain, family owned, we only make 3, 000, uh, 15,000 cases of wine. The things that you touch in a store, probably looking at 30,000 to 300,000 to 3 million cases of wine per uh, skew, depending on what you're buying. So your wine today is really boutique, uh, but it's attached to a message that's not understood. No one knows who Bouchain is. Um, small wineries are being locked out of stores because we don't have enough wine to sell them. And we're being locked out of restaurants because we don't have enough uh, of a margin to give them. And so when I got to Bouchain, you know, I thought to myself, well, how do I improve our, our market share? How do I improve our storyline? And we used WebEx 
as a, a customer capture. I waited for our new building to be completed. I, I was inheriting a corner office that overlooked this vineyard behind me. And we tell customers, hey, you know, we're so glad to meet you on vacation, but we don't want to lose our connection to you when you get back to New Jersey or New York or Florida or wherever you're going. Um, part of our membership now is that you can have a dinner party and you can fire up WebEx and we'll host you and your friends for a quick wine tasting before your, before your dinners. Or you can open up a bottle of our wine and we'll, we'll ask, answer a Q&A from your home. And meanwhile, behind us will be our vineyard. Well, I abdicated. I'm the only person in the wine industry who is willing to abdicate a corner office overlooking a thousand acres of land for the sake of his customer base. And, um, and so that's the reason we, we originally engaged in WebEx. We, uh, we were desperate for more customers and more important or as important, we were desperate to continue our customer journey. The irony is I waited a year and a half for my new corner office. Then our new visitor center was complete. Two months later, it was COVID and we were closed for, for almost full on two years. And what we're doing today is the unexpected conclusion or, or unexpected chapters of an original dream. Through COVID, uh, we were closed and yet sold four times as much wine as we would have had we been open. Companies like Cisco, Spire, um, not only did, uh, was I able to trans transport people to Napa, but they transported me all over the country and occasionally all over the world. And suddenly coming out of COVID, we're using a bunch of technology we never knew existed, not only to do this, to, to, um, but to have hybrid moments. So my customer base, my wine customer base, I, I knew had finally changed when we were hosting 90 year olds for their, for their birthday party. And now here I am getting ready to host uh, C-level guests and, and director level guests and, and, and corporations for hybrid moments where they can come here and broadcast across the country or use WebEx to broadcast with our camera systems, um, uh, cooking classes and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then feed their guests food from their star chefs in our kitchen or come up here and taste fruit and talk to people. Um, I set myself up today uh, and I'm gonna stop talking to, to answer any of your questions, but on one hand, on the one hand, my, my uh, WebEx is being fired up by a Meraki system inside this cabinet, um, powered by the solar panel you see. And then I'll just allude to this because something really exciting has come out of COVID. We, we could have gone out of business. Everyone in the Napa Valley basically laid off their staff, except Pushane. We were the first people in the world to use this to ex uh, WebEx for wine tasting. I, I started toying with it six months before COVID and, every, and everyone in my MBA class thought I was crazy. And then now we're using technology to measure temperature and wind through our vineyard to better understand how to plant and photosynthesize and, and be better stewards of the land. And so what you're seeing to my right, two little white things behind me, they're measuring the temperature above and below our leaf line. Who would guess that the story of the wine in your hand is uh, described by that four foot difference in those two sensors behind me? So that's what we're broadcasting today. We're not just broadcasting a discussion about um, wine. We're not just extending the customer journey like I had imagined. We're, we're talking about a totally language of the wine business. It's gonna, it stands to change the way we use water and gas and labor completely differently. Uh, the vineyard, by the way, vineyards of the Napa Valley are worth about $500,000 an acre. We own about 100 acres to give you a sense of the value of the land you're looking at behind me. And yet, if these sensors figure out that, oh, you know what, because of global warming, there are parts of Brian's vineyard that we could plant Cabernet, my vineyard goes from $500,000 to $800,000 or $900,000 of worth on the balance sheet per acre. So that's the story we're talking about today. I don't know if anyone has any geeky wine questions. Um, I'm, I'm really good at mixing lies with truth. So ask me any questions if you're interested about wine. And for those of you who are interested in about uh, maybe how WebEx might help small family businesses stay alive, please ask me those questions too, because they're both very, I'm filled with vibrant answers about both. It's helped me keep my staff uh, afloat and employed for two years where most of the rest of the Napa Valley lost everybody.
I'll ask a question because I uh, love wine and everything about wine and watched a lot of the like Psalm documentaries. <clears throat> so you talked about all the people that like touch, you know, touch the wine, that create the label, all those types of things. How many people do you guys actually have at your vineyard? And I'm sorry if you mentioned that before and I missed it, but like how many people do you guys actually, you know, employ that like go into making like a, I guess, you know, the two bottles of wines that you, that we have today? So first off, the one bottle of wine is from a part of my vineyard that I'm looking at. The other bottle of wine is from the part of the vineyard you're looking at. One has a, a direction to sun and wind slightly differently than the other. And we're part of the Napa Valley that's windy. And, and, and if it weren't for the wind that you're seeing nearly blow me over, uh, the whole Napa Valley wouldn't make good wine. You need warm and cold temperatures to get good acid in wine, good flavor in wine, good good uh, aroma and the people that help us do that we have a here we're small enough so that we have a vineyard management company if we were a larger winery we might employ, employ about two three four hundred people just to maintain um maintain about 500 acres would would uh, translate to about that many vineyard workers um depending on what you're doing but um but our vineyard management company uh, takes care of about 70 uh, ranches and they employ about, uh, well, they use about 200 tractors alone. So they've got about 500 people. And that's part of the story. It's the farming part of the story, which these sensors uh, behind me stand to change. Uh, members of my sales team, I've got about 30 people on my sales team and members of our, uh, of our wine production crew, you got about five six if you include the guy that runs our bottling line that handles our production awesome what happened by the way it's kind of a footnote to napa for those of you who are on the east coast um during covid all the restaurants went out of business and all the wineries closed temporarily and the napa valley lost about 30 percent of its labor as a consequence no one could afford to live here before covid and once they lost their jobs, they just went back home or, or went back to school or, or went to work in another industry. And so post COVID, a lot of wineries can't even reopen and, and restaurants are that used to be open seven days a week are only open five. So we really got lucky as a winery to have a new vector for sales that allowed me to keep everyone employed. It was a commitment made by our owners. They've owned the place for 41 years. That's sort of our family touch here on this brand um but in the end it was webex that allowed us to ex extend our sales and it made such a difference for us it's it's really the first time virtual tasting no matter how wineries are doing it, it's the first time in 15 years that small family wineries have had a national voice again and and to put a more uh, fine point on it the u.s is the number one market in the world by volume and by average price for wine so if you lose your uh, U.S. market share, uh, chances are you're going out of business, yeah, at least if you're an American winery. Anyone else have any questions? I have another one if nobody else does. <laughs> I have How one. Go ahead. Um, I'm just curious with the mindset of the company. So many companies look at IT and just don't see the value. They see it as a, a cost center um, and not... Um, strategic part of their business. So how did the leadership, um, I guess, was it a mindset shift? Were they already on board with technology? Um, were you part of like selling them on how technology could be a differentiator? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it's a great question because I've learned a lot of things in this journey of mine. I This wasn't originally my idea. Two years ago, I didn't know how to hook my TV up to my computer with an HDMI cord. Um, but when somebody gave me the original concept, I was like, that's brilliant. I, we need to extend our customer journey. I, I need to uh, find a, a, a broader customer base, elongate my, my discussion points and, and, and relevancy, et cetera, et cetera, provide more service to my customers. And when I approached our owners, I said, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Copeland, I, I'm inheriting this beautiful corner office and, and it's perfect for this idea I had in grad school. Um, 
I remember we had already doubled business by then in, over my first year, and Mrs. Copeland said, Brian, you're not, you must have an office. You are not allowed to turn another, uh, uh, another space into a tasting room because <laughs> I had taken over the entire property and, <laughs> and she, you know, was understandably uh, skeptical, I suppose, but she kind of knew that I was going to, you know, do a test run on this anyway, and she let me. So I got very lucky that in the early days, I had already sort of transformed her business a little bit. And she gave me some more leeway and a little bit more money. And, and then I got, we all got lucky because of course, once COVID happened, and now we, now, as we so readily talk about hybrid spaces, this is the new reality for everyone, isn't it really? But while corporate people knew how to use WebEx, mom and pop people did not. And that's the difference now. So number one, the game's changed. The customer has changed. It makes this much more profound, really, uh, for a winery. Um, but when you think about the wine business, almost nothing new has changed since the Romans ended up in France and realized they could use French oak barrels to house wine in instead of clay amphora. And that's almost literally true. Wineries sell nothing on their website. Uh, Bouchain just finished revamping its website into a new uh, platform because our old website wasn't even coded. I didn't even sell 1% of my sales on my website. And so this is true and indicative of the entire wine industry. But I'll tell you some stats that might make, uh, so from a sales point of view, I extend my customer journey. Everyone can understand that. I can uh, extend uh, the vibrancy of my wine club. Uh, our owners understood that because it's a, a huge portion of every winery sales. And then for, for all of us on this call, we all know that you get out the smoke and mirror machine and, and start up the, you know, the fog and, and, you know, sales is about energy and excitement, something new and a differentiating factor. Um, over the next two months, I'll have very significant national press on what we're doing right now. But two years ago, I was in the Washington Post because we were the first people to do virtual tasting at all. And the Washington Post was interested in the story because of COVID. So there were some early successes that helped us prepare what, for what we're doing now. And to be honest, I can articulate this part uh, and, um, and convince ownership to give me X, Y, and Z amount of money in my budget or allow, allow me to allocate this much money, whatever it is, to um, an extent, a new sales channel, really. But it was because of COVID and our relationship with new corporate customers that we became, we were put in a position to understand I, IoT. Um, and so I've watched some really miraculous things happen. Number one, I had, I, I wanted to say relevant coming out of COVID. And, and so I, I, I asked one day, um, one of my Cisco contacts, you know, I, I'd really, is there any chance, I don't know how to do it, but I'd love to be able to broadcast from the middle of my vineyard. Well, I don't know how to in, even conceive of what is surrounding me right now, but I've purposely positioned my camera so you can see what um, what it what happens when engineers hear a problem and come up with a solution? I couldn't have done any of it on my own. There was no there is no one in the whole wine industry who would understand how to hook up fluid mesh to Meraki to a camera to WebEx. And so uh, a lot of sometimes if you're diligent, luck counts too, and that's what happened to us here. But it was only what got the ball rolling on this very hill. Three months ago, um, we began to fully understand the potential of these sensors behind me. I knew that as we collected data, uh, we could begin to understand the difference between this hill and 75 feet away a lot better. And in the wine business, this hill versus 75 feet away, the delta might be 300 times the profit. Um, so when you think of a, 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 a hundred acres like we own, let's say, um, it's not all, especially in higher end uh, wine regions, it's, it's not all equivalent. One part of the vineyard might be planted in Sauvignon Blanc, the other part in Cabernet, and the delta between those two is uh, three times the value. So 
what we're interested in is this weather story here. And as the data comes in, we may very, very, very easily begin to ascribe a different figure on our balance sheet to the value of this land. So that's a huge theoretical as and. You know, from an from a sales point of view, the owners were maybe intrigued. But 3 months ago, we stood up here with our vineyard management company and we began to listen to their problems. How uh, we haven't ever had an accurate water reading off of our vineyard. How we, how they have to as, uh, assign 2 people to travel to 70 different vineyards around the Napa Valley to take manual water readings in a truck. And that, and I wouldn't have known how to help those people. The, the magic happened when we had. Uh, Cisco people here to listen to the problem and and they knew how to apply the technology. And so there it's a more. Um, philosophical moment that has to happen. The right people to listen to the right problem and then a business like ours that's willing to act on it. And it's just a very interesting. I think of it almost as a. A cultural uh, confrontation. You need to find businesses that are interested in moving forward and not looking back. And um, and and I I'll just to to rephrase this again. Every small family business is losing market share and going out of business slowly. In the wine industry, they're being gobbled up by huge international players. But even for huge international players, if you imagine that they could look at a dashboard and collect data from from sensors like this and sit in an office and look at million. Uh, hundreds of miles of land all over the world and begin to understand photosynthesis better and the use of water better and the use of gas better. Suddenly it's transformative, but it's nothing I could have done on my own. And then I think what it was is that we had just been transformed by the initial lucky stages of IoT and WebEx. So much so that our owners were willing to double down and invest on on the next phases of exploration. Thank you, Brian. That was very interesting and it's very exciting what's going on with your winery. Thank you. Hey, Brian, do you, um, do you, I know it's a little bit more abstract, but do you think that, um, you know, since, since the, the start of using some of the sensors and stuff, do you think it's shifted the, you know, the, the, the way the wine has actually come out or made it taste any better because you were able to, you know, utilize you know, better grapes or at the right times or anything like that. Actually, some of this is very tangible, but I'll joke with all of you. Number one, WebEx allows me to talk to you guys. Uh, I would never have been able to have this discussion. No winery could have three years ago. So this alone is a transformative discussion for the wine industry from a sales point of view and marketing point of view. Some of the answer to your question, though, is 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 even more tangible than that. When you can put a sensor on a tractor and geofence it, suddenly you understand how um, on, a, on a daily ops basis, you can lower costs. So if nothing else, even if sales didn't improve, we're in the business right now of becoming better stewards of the land and lowering our, our costs and our P&L. As it turns out, because we're successful on both sides of this, the, the top and bottom line of the P&L is being affected and then to answer your more, your question more fully, this is our first full cycle where we're t we're collecting the data and understanding how it relates to our normal anecdotal decisions about bringing in wine, grapes. So for those of you who have ever had wine, we all know that the mouthfeel changes and the acid profile changes. So some wine is more like water, some wine is more like so um, one percent milk, two percent milk, half and half cream. And the mouthfeel changes really substantially based on heat. The hotter the areas for wine, the more sugars will develop in the grapes. The later you pick, you have more sugar. The earlier you pick, you have more acid. So for those of you who don't know how to, you know, you're in a store and, and you, you wish you had a nice crisp wine for a hot day, turn the bottle around and buy a bottle with lower alcohol rather than higher alcohol. For those of you who are having a big bruiser uh, steak or you're going to have a barbecue in your backyard and you want something heavy and chewy, turn the bottle around. Buy something closer to 15% alcohol, 14 and a half. So those are the decisions. Uh, those are the metrics. 
for cost, uh, on the customer side that these sensors will begin to affect, um, we'll begin to understand not only when to harvest better, but when to harvest particular parts of our vineyard better. You probably had a map in your, in your uh, box today. It looks like a, just a pretty arbitrary thing, but actually what it, what it is is that if you ever buy a winery, a wine a vineyard, you're not gonna probably plant it all in the same thing. You're gonna hedge your bets against a really hot year, a really cold year, um, a late harvest, uh, an, an early frost, these kinds of things. And so you're gonna plant your vineyard in blocks. Uh, think of planting uh, bushes around your house. There are shadier sides of your house. There are sunnier sides of your house. Certain flowers will do better in one side, certain flowers on another. Well, in the wine business, the, you know, the flowers are worth $10,000 a ton, so to speak. And so you're really interested in um, optimizing your opportunities. And um, that's what the sensors will, will ultimately change. For 500 years, it's been uh, monks and then following monks, winemakers, walking through a vineyard and just anecdotally understanding what parts of their vineyard might need more water, what parts of their vineyard might need to be planted at a different height or at a different vine row. But no one's ever, ever systematically collected the data. And uh, like I said, we're at a point where 40% of the wineries in California are worried they don't even have enough water to produce any grapes at all. So when you start thinking, oh, I'm going to, because of sensors, understand the difference between vine row three and vine row 103 and vine row 53, and I'm going to water them differently, and I'm going to water every incremental part of the vineyard differently. Um, what's neat is that you can affect your water use dramatically, but, you, but long term, next year, if I'm hosting you guys again, I'm hoping the wines in front of you are $250 instead of the value that they have now. It, it'll liter in a serious way to probably take us five years to do something like that, to really dial down, dial down into new sets of insights and to link them to our, our harvest patterns. But that's, that's the promise of what we're doing on a more theor theoretical scale. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's cool. <laughs> I think about it from, like he said, like you look at sprinklers on your lawn and just having a rain sensor to be able to turn them on and off is one thing, but you could get even deeper and deeper and deeper. So. That is exactly right. And, uh, you know, so when you think about a vineyard in America, you guys, this is different in Europe. In Europe, the vineyards oftentimes are, are quite a bit older. But in the States, you're looking at an amortization table of about 20 years, 25 years. To plant a vineyard in Napa costs about $60,000 an acre. And so you got to somehow get your money back, right? Um, and you do so by deciding, well, how many tons per acre do I want to plant? What kinds of varietals can I, can I plant based on the weather? And, and then what do I need to sustain that? How much water? Do I even have water enough to sustain what I need to do? So um, what we're doing right now will impact our vineyard over the next cycle of its replanting. We, we bought this vineyard in 81. We've replanted most of it once. Um, and so as the data comes in, we'll be able to, um, to tweak things like, oh, you know what? Because of global warming, there's parts of our vineyard warm enough now to, to get Cabernet ripe. We're going to replant Cabernet. And then for those of you who are really want to get geeky, if you can still see those two sensors with the wind, one above our leaf line, one below our leaf line. In the wine business, if I turn around because of data and replant that vineyard, six inches closer to the ground, it's going to get more heat in the morning from the earth and less heat in the afternoon from the sun. So we'll change the, the sine wave pattern of morning and sun heat, which will affect how the photosynthesis happens. Um, it sounds uh, unimportant, but it, for us, it's the difference perhaps between a 95 point score and a 98 point score. And for you as customers, that means it's the difference between maybe $60 a bottle and $260 a bottle. So it really, <laughs> these two sensors seem really theoretical until you attach them to those kinds of results. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a big difference. <laughs>
and and we're lucky, you know, we have owners that are interested in in new things. But what I what I've learned through this process is that everyone in the wine industry, it's sort of like me, you know, I know I could lose 30 pounds, I should lose 30 pounds and eat more vegetables. Do I do it? No. Well, in the wine business, everyone has the same problem. We, we fear fire. 50% of wineries can no longer get insured in Northern California, by the way, because of fires. And so one of the things that we're going to do next is employ particulate matter sensors so that we can figure out if there's enough smoke to ruin our, our crop in a certain year. And, you know, so we're in a position a little by luck and a little by hard work where we're using technology to solve our problem. Other wineries don't know what they don't know. They don't know about the technology. And then other wineries that might hear eventually of us doing this, they'll know about the technology, but they won't, they'll, they'll suffer from a, a zombie mode. You know, they, they won't get out of their own way to solve their problem. But what I've been stunned by is all of this stuff around me is wireless. I, I, I couldn't have literally, but I almost could have lit, literally set up the sensors myself. And um, I never thought I'd be broadcasting WebEx from the middle of my vineyard. In a second, when I stop talking, I'll, I'll spin the camera around. You get to see what the Northern Bay, San Francisco Bay looks like to you, those of you on the East Coast. Are you a fan of aging wine at all? What'd you say? Are you a fan of aging wine, like buy a bottle of wine? I know you mentioned that U.S. like if you feel like the U.S. people probably buy a bottle of wine, drink that bottle of wine. But like, do you think that wine should be aged at all, like any period of time, like depending on? I just want to know your thoughts on that. Well, I grew up on the East Coast, so I I grew up on old wine and the lore of old wine, and I couldn't believe when I came to California, I'd go to dinner parties. And winemakers would show up, and they would show up with these double, double sized bottles, magnums of of, mm -hmm. of Cabernet. They'd be worth, you know, literally seven hundred dollars a bottle. They'd they'd take them out of the winery, out of the winery cellar. So they'd been sold, uh, aged perfectly. They're twenty five years old, and oh my God, I'd start salivating when I saw these guys and women walk through the door, and I'd race over to try their wine. And all my California friends and the winemakers would taste just a little bit of this wine to see how it had aged. And then they'd all walk over to the other side of the of the dinner party and drink the new stuff. And I'd be left <laughs> drinking the $700 bottle. You know, like I couldn't understand that. Um, so the answer to your question is whether you're East Coast or West Coast. The West Coast peeps, they grew up in California. They grew up on California sunshine. They grew up on new wine. They want it to be all big berries and, and blackberries and cherries and these kinds of things. If you are an East Coaster or if you have a little patience, you're interested in old wine. So first off, the difference between the two wines in front of you, red versus white. When you make a red wine, unlike white, you use the grape skins like a tea bag. And just as with your tea at home, the nature of your red wine is a function of the type of tea. And um, hang on one second, take the truck. Okay. So, um, this is my first broadcast from the top of the vineyard, so I, I'm, I don't want to be shameless and, and fail to announce I've had a little help. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a historic moment for me. Uh, IoT for me personally is making me feel uh, much more hip and cooler, <laughs> uh, but I don't know how to do it, so other people have to t train me. But so the reason I bring it up is the difference between red and white wine or like in a Chardonnay. Why is Chardonnay golden in color? Well, it's because it went into oak barrel. There is such a thing as an un-oak Chardonnay, but you hardly ever see it in a store. Almost all Chardonnay is gold. And it, it's like Blanco tequila versus Resposado tequila. It's more spicy. It's golden in color because of the molecules from a barrel. In the case of red wine, as you age it, or even white, because a lot of whites, I'm having a Riesling right now. Most of you think of Riesling as a sweet thing because that's what Americans uh, think of Riesling as. But it it can be very bracing and, and equally as acidic as any Sauvignon Blanc you've ever had. And in those cases, Riesling can age 30 years or 20. So what happens is with red wine um, and white, if it has enough acid, and in order to have enough acid, wine needs cold nights. So in Napa, it's 85 or 105 degrees every day, no humidity. At night, it's 55 degrees every night. And during the day, the grapes 
develop the grape juice. At night, they develop molecules in the grape skins. That becomes your tea bag for red wine. And in the case of older red wine, the molecules from the barrel, the molecules from the grape skins do two things. They begin to knit together and create longer molecular strands, which we experience as, cu as customers or as wine aficionados as a more silky characteristic. If you ever buy a, um, a young Malbec or a young Cabernet, um, if they haven't added, kept a little sugar in there, just like you would with coffee, how do you get coffee to be less bitter? You add cream or you add sugar. Well, in the case of wine for, at a cheaper level, you can keep it a little sweet and round it out. But the more expensive stuff, anything probably over $50, $60, Malbec, Merlot, Cabernet, they'll have a molecule from the grape skins that sticks to your teeth. It acts like a force field. It's the football player of wine. And you can't really pierce past it. To... Well, you go ahead. Yeah, just thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, again, if you have any questions, please reach out. Um, we'd be more than happy to continue the conversation. Um, and we'll be sure to follow up with Brian and get that answer back to you guys. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Have a great yeah. day. Thank you so much. Good have evening, a good one. Everybody.